Hola, buenas. Good morning. It's a really great pleasure to be with you today. I hope today we have more sun than yesterday. Hello. Buenos días. Es un gran placer estar con ustedes hoy. Espero que hoy tenemos más sol que ayer. Not bad, huh? So this is an app called Say Hi, and I use it everywhere. Uh, six months ago, I was in Japan. I had a six, uh, roughly a half an hour conversation with the sushi chef. I spoke in German, he spoke in Japanese through this. So, in roughly half a year, the first company will present a device that you put an earpiece in, and you don't actually have the mobile, you just do it on your wristwatch, and it will translate in real time in 35 languages. In real time. So you can finally have a relationship with somebody that doesn't speak your language. If, if that's what you want. <laughs> I mean, talk about this. I mean, this is basically, these devices here are our second brain. They are the external brain. And for some of our kids, it's the first brain. Because you know? you know, they're always looking there. But everything is in here. Your music, the news, social network, dating. Right? Everything is in here. Now imagine if this device is going to go onto my eyeglasses and I can command it by looking. That's already here, Google Glass, right? But in the very near future, virtual reality, I can connect directly, you know, with glasses or a helmet, and then in 10 years I can connect it direct from my neocortex, like the uh, cochlear implant for hearing. Right? Imagine if that is a reality. So who in this room would not want to be superhuman, superhumano. Everyone. Many of you would say, oh, that's maybe not. You know, maybe it's too dangerous. But many people would say, yes, you know, if I can work a hundred times as fast. If you use virtual reality, you know, the, the glasses that you're wearing, uh, accountant, bookkeeper, financial control, doctors, you could be a hundred times as fast. But what else would it do? Where is that future taking us? We're looking at a future where it's essentially like this. Where people and technology are coming together. Now think about this, you know, we may be the last people for the foreseeable future that actually know what offline means. You're not connected. You know, I was, at the, I was in Tanzania with my uh, younger son, who was then 18, you know, in Africa. In Zanzibar, actually, and we're on the beach, and we're, we're sitting down to enjoy the beach. My son pulls his mobile out, keeps hitting it, says, my music is, is broken, my music is not working. And that was the first time in his life where he had been going somewhere without internet. That's why the music wasn't working. And I said to him that, you know, we're in Zanzibar on the beach, there's no internet, and he couldn't believe it. So, you know, offline is now a mental stage. Uh, offline is a new luxury. And in just five years, we're going to have 6G networks. We're going to have 9 billion people connected to the Internet in 2030. Today, it's 3.6 billion. That will change everything, positive and, and negative. What we have to make sure is that we understand technology is not good or bad. It just is. It exists. It doesn't have morals. It is neutral. You know, you can be addicted to television. Right? Some people are addicted watching television seven hours a day, and you can be addicted to Facebook. So what we have to make sure is we cannot forbid technology. We cannot have too many rules. But we do have to think about a balance. When is it good? When is it bad? Our world will change more in the next 20 years than in the previous 300 years. It's hard to comprehend that's true because we're talking about the Industrial Revolution, World War II, television, the phone, internet. But now, these devices, technology, is going inside my head. You know, using the mobile phone, the smartphone, using social networks, it changes how you're thinking. It changes how you're feeling. 
And imagine if this information goes deep inside of us, it will change who we are. And very soon we can have nanobots in our bloodstream to fix our cholesterol. This is not science fiction. This is 10 years ago. All of you in this audience, I don't see anybody over 80 here, uh, you will see this. Don't believe for a minute that I'm talking about science fiction. This is now. All these things, virtual uh, reality, data mining, it's already here, 10 years. So, it could be heaven or it could be hell. The question is, what do we want it to be? The question is not to use no technology. There is no such option. There is no option to go back and say, we are going to go back to not having smartphones or the internet. We're going like this. We're going at mind-boggling speed. We can take offline luxury, but we, you know, that's the future. It's technology. We have to make sure that we think about how we can make this good for humans, not good for money. There is a difference. I have to emphasize, you know, in America you have to make that difference. Yeah. I live in Switzerland <laughs> where we have lots of those debates. But who is responsible for making it heaven? It's not just us. I mean, if you have trouble with Facebook, you leave. Yeah. But it's politics. Yeah. Every politician, every governor, every mayor, every prime minister is now in charge of our future. And we have to make laws and rules and social contracts, as Telefonica says, a new social contract, contact social. That's really what we're doing here. So, it could be heaven. Huh? We could touch God. I mean, I'm not religious, but we could be like superhuman. And, I mean, this is no joke. If, you, if you're wearing virtual reality glasses, you can work a hundred times as fast because you can go inside the information like Tom Cruise in Minority Report. If you're a policeman and you're using technology, and all of a sudden you have to wonder, is it uh, everything that's known is, is going to show up? I mean, this is, we're already living in this world. Everything, everywhere, everyone. In China, every single person is subject to face recognition. So if you cross the street in China and you're registered and it's a red light, you get a ticket in email. The Chinese government will send you a ticket because they scan your face. I'm not sure we could do that here, you know. I, everybody would get a ticket all the time. Yeah. But this is not definitely not a good thing that we want to have. We have to decide on what we do. This is what technology does. And it's always been like this. The nuclear bomb. We can make a power plant. I, I don't think that's good, but some people do. We can use technology for all kinds of reasons. Technology has no ethics. Technology does not care about love, emotions, feelings, consciousness, sentience, whatever you want to call it, spirituality. Technology doesn't care. It's a zero and a one. That's it. But these zeros and ones are now becoming so powerful that we are likely to have a computer with an IQ of a billion in less than 10 years. A computer that can compute faster than anything that we could ever hope to achieve. And so the question of ethics is really a simple question. It's about the power and the right that we have to do something and choosing what is the right thing to do. There is a difference. Technically speaking, many things become possible. So Facebook is the best example. Facebook takes all of our information, puts it into all kinds of technology and algorithms, and out comes your profile. Facebook is, a, is actually making a copy of you, a digital copy of you. Uh, some people would say, you know, we have an average of 100 million data points on Facebook, every user. You should download them sometime to take a look. That is a digital copy. Some people are saying that this is a better, Facebook knows you better than your husband or your wife. Because you know, everything you do, like same with Google, is in there. So the question is, can Facebook, for example, behave ethically? I mean, we're talking about your information on Facebook is worth $42 a year to Facebook. And the more unethical they behave, the bigger the value. 
That cannot be good for us. <laughs> so we have to think about where this is going. Uh, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, uh, seven days ago at the European Commission event on, on data privacy, this is what he said. We shouldn't sugarcoat the consequences. This is surveillance. And these stockpiles of personal data serve only to enrich the companies that collect them. Okay, this is the CEO of the biggest technology company in the world. This is the company that makes the most money, has sold 2.4 billion iPhones. They are in the business of connecting. And he says what is going on is surveillance. That's because it's gotten so good and so powerful. And Apple, I think, is the only company that tr at least tries to keep it more inside. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting dichotomy, but quite clearly, I mean, here we have huge examples. You know, Telefonica I mentioned earlier. We have SAP, a tech company, having a manifesto about artificial intelligence. We have people asking for regulation. Uh, we're debating if we should let the tech companies have this debate. I mean, think about this for a second. Who is in charge of discussing the future? Is it the politicians? The king of Spain? Is it us? Who is, who is debating the future? IBM, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba. They are talking about the future and they're having fantastic stories. The future is about us. It's not about some box. It's not about some network, but making money with downloads or, or advertising. The future is a bit more than that. And we should be debating the future. Look at the discussion about digital ethics. It's exploding. I started this five years ago and nobody was interested. That's like, you know, sustainability or so. <laughs> Four days ago, Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the internet, really, came up with a new manifesto called The Contract for the Web. It's a new way to think about how we're going to do the internet. This is a huge movement, and this has to be a European movement. Because what is happening, America does not care about this, because America is about the primary commercial benefit of technology. Not to say that Americans don't care, there's plenty of Americans that do. <laughs> I lived there 17 years. But the philosophy in America is not humanistic. I mean, think about the difference for a second. In Europe, we are humanists. I think all of you, I think if I, if I go around all over Europe asking that question, everybody wants to be human. If I ask the question in Silicon Valley, what do you want to be in the future? Guess what the answer is? I want to transcend humanity. I want to be superhuman. That's the answer. And if I go to China, it's the same answer, except that the state is organizing it. Yeah, not, not the private companies. So we in Europe have a really, we have to have a good position on this issue that we are interested in having technology for the benefit of society. So digital ethics I would define at the, as the difference between whatever technology things we can do and what is the right thing to do and basically putting humanity first. Today, Many things not, are not really working so well yet, like you saw, for example, the language recognition and face recognition. It's kind of working well, but if I spoke to this device really quickly, like when I talked to you, it would not get it. But in two or three years, it'll be perfect. In 10 years, unlimited computing power. So we must make sure that whatever these devices are doing, that it's first designed for human benefit, for collective benefit, for equal benefit, not for the, just for the rich, for all of us that can use technology. Because here's the problem. As technology is exploding exponentially, we're still the same. You are not going to be exponential because there's bigger computers. You cannot implant a chip in your head for the next 10 years. <laughs> Maybe later you can. <laughs> yeah. Technology is exponential, but humans are not. We cannot multitask, we, we are all living longer, that's true, but we're never going to beat the machines. If you have kids, think about this. Your kids should learn, not learn anything that a machine can do. Routine, bookkeeping, insurance, financial advice, driving a car. 
call center. Of course, they wouldn't choose that anyway. <laughs> but we're at the pivot point. So basically what's happening here is we're at the takeoff point of technology making pretty much everything possible, and that is only 10 years away. But our ethics are still the same. We talk about copyright, well, we talk about energy, we talk, and we're not thinking about the things that are basically looking at us right now, right today, because this is what's happening. Data is the new oil, and artificial intelligence, which I explained shortly, is the new electricity. This is an irresistible gold rush. I work with many companies that do this, technology companies. We're talking about a $16 trillion revenue stream. Who are the most powerful companies in the world today? Who are in this vortex of power? I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Enjoy it if you can. But these are the companies. It's no longer oil and gas or banking or the military. It's data. Search engine, social media, data companies, e-commerce. The top four companies on this list top four companies have more money than the GDP of France. They could buy France. Not that they want to, but think about that. But I mean, we're talking about huge, I mean, look at the uh, economic firepower. They have tripled in value. They can do anything. And they are building the brain. A global brain to look at us. Look at the Internet of Things, connecting cars, houses, 14 trillion. Artificial intelligence, 15.7 trillion. So, huge temptation, huge benefit, not a bad thing, but we have to make sure that we don't get shorted. That we lose our rights, that we become lonely because we don't have any real friends except for social networks. That we lose our jobs and not, there's not, nothing to, to pay for that, no, art, no, no tax, nothing. Because AI is really defined as this, you know, we're talking about machines that in the very near future and today, they can hear, they can see, they can speak, they can learn, and some people say that they can think. Now, when you think about learning machines, cognitive computing, they are not learning like we are learning. They're learning from patterns. It's not human at all. And their thinking will never be human, at least for the next 50 years. But it doesn't have to be. I mean, imagine a machine that has the computing power of a million human brains. That machine exists today. It's like 500 million euros and takes the whole electricity of a small city. That machine will be in here in five years. And I can ask a question like, what is the future of Burgos and who's going to be the next mayor? the machine will give me an answer. So we're talking about very, very powerful things happening. So this is the landscape of what has already happened uh, in artificial intelligence. So the blue line is what basically machines have already achieved. Cloud computing, Jeopardy they can play. They can play poker. They can play Go. They can replace the call center. They can run advertising. They can be computer vision. They can even do debating. They don't do it as well as humans do, but it's only a matter of time before all call centers will be automated. 21 million jobs. Not a very good job, probably. Hey, a job is a job. And there's a cutoff. You know, you can say, okay, there is a cutoff to where machines are not suitable. Because they don't understand. They don't have context. They don't feel. I think that cutoff will remain for quite some time. But not everybody can move to that pyramid to work. <laughs> we have to think about what that means for social structure. We have to come to the, to the rescue of people who are on that level. Because I think basically on the lower part is intelligent assistance, IA. That's pretty good stuff. It's just smart software. It's not at all like humans. And that's what everybody's doing today. The key word is smart everything. So if you're in business, you're going to make everything smart using mobile and cloud. And then there's artificial intelligence, the next level. I give this the orange light. Could be interesting, could be dangerous. But here's the red light. Artificial general intelligence, AGI. This is intelligence that's like us. 
I do not think we should allow people to build an AGI. Imagine a computer with this kind of IQ that can be like us and be networked with other machines. That would not end well for us. So I think we need a moratorium. We have to figure out, you know, it, this is hugely disruptive. I mean, we're talking about an arms race already. Putin has already said several times that Russia intends to be the leader of an AI, and China is saying the same thing, and of course the Americans, and India. Maybe Spain. So, I mean, this is a big question. You know, disruptive is fine, you know, that's progress. But existential? There is a big difference between the two. Because this is what's going to happen. That technology will get so smart, so fast, so powerful, that we will have this kind of intelligence explosion. That everything is being understood by machines. And then we have to ask a simple question. What do we do in a world that's so super smart with machines? What's going to happen to what we like? You know, it's interesting, many things that we like are not at all like machines. Mystery, discovery, accidents, mistakes, lies, stories, art, cannot be defined by zeros and ones. Humans don't live by data. We live by experience and by relationships. When I meet you later in the hallway, it takes an, uh, me, an average human, 0.4 seconds to recognize the other human. That's without saying a single word. It does all the things that machines can never do. This is why I think we need to make sure that they will never do this. So uh, we need a moratorium on this, like we have for nuclear weapons. On to more positive topics. Yeah, I have suggested many times that the main problem will be in roughly 10 years what we want to do rather than what we can do. So we need a digital ethics council. And this can start in countries, but it should be global. Basically, imagine the old Greek, uh, Socrates and others, Aristoteles, sitting together and thinking about what is the right thing to do. That's what we need. People who do nothing else, no CEOs, not really politicians, a council of the wise, because these problems are going to come. You know, we're building, essentially, a new intelligence. I mean, don't be fooled by this. The goal of most technology companies is to automate, to reduce jobs, and to make more money by being indispensable. That's not evil. That's not bad. But it's commercial. You know? It has no intent to give back value that is not commercial. So many questions, and we're building a new nervous system, basically. And what we see on the mobile device is only the beginning. So this is a new meta-intelligence, and these are the questions I have. What about security, protection, privacy, sustainability, governance, social contract? Who is in charge of that? You know, it's funny, we're spending trillions of dollars on building technology, but we're spending very little money on these questions. That's a very bad idea. Because today we're sitting here and we're saying, okay, this is not really working yet. The Internet of Things, you know, artificial intelligence, it's slowly getting there. But we don't have robots here in the streets or robots serving our food. So that's a little bit away, but it's coming. And who is going to address those questions? So Tim Cook again said, CEO of Apple, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It does not want anything. The great things that with technology we have to do. Technology is a tool. It will do whatever. If you tell technology to say that all of us should be turned into paper clips, the technology will try to do that as soon as it can, because that's what it's supposed to do. <laughs> so the key question is now changing from this. This is today or yesterday. We wonder about, you know, if we can do something, how we can do something, what the costs are. Is it possible to have a robot for elderly? Is a self-driving car possible? But in five, seven, maybe ten years, depending on the country, this is the only question. The question is why? And who? Who do we trust? Do we trust the top 20 companies on the list? Some of them we used to trust. Do they prove their trust? They're going to have to prove their trust because they are giant international cartels. 
Facebook has 2.4 billion users. It's the largest country in the world. And Zuckerberg has more power than any real president. So we have to think about this, you know, where we are going with uh, I think many of these things are not sustainable. Think about the addiction to social networks. There's probably people in this room who are addicted to Instagram. Or, of course, our mobile phone. The filter bubble. We only hear what we're supposed to hear on social networks because we're supposed to come back and stay. We're not supposed to hear things that don't agree with us. That is not democracy, that's not a medium, that's called manipulation. And that is, you know, if we, if we, are, if we really want to have good media, we have to invest in it. That's why public media is so important. It is uh, unsustainable for us to use a news engine like Facebook that's essentially looking to shoot down democracy. And this is the funny part, the bad part, not by purpose, by pure technical feasibility. You have $72 million, you can manipulate an election. Yeah. So I think we have to fix this, we have to take a look at it. We have to take a look at what's called the externalities. If you know anything about sustainability, the oil business and so on. We have these debates all the time and it's finally starting to happen. But we also have externalities, the side effects in the digital business. We have addiction. We have this brain-computer interface idea. We have domination by robots. We have all kinds of things and these are externalities. They have to become part of the digital economy. If you're a company that's doing business in the digital economy, you have to think about the side effects. You know, the American gun lobby, the NRA, you know, the Organization of Gun for Manufacturers, their favorite saying is that guns don't kill people, people kill people. So if Facebook says, our system wasn't hacked, we didn't do anything wrong, somebody used Facebook wrong, that's the same kind of lame excuse. You are responsible for what you're building because it changes society, it changes our mind, it changes the future. So we need to move to a new economic system that's happening in the next 20 years, roughly 2030. It's been discussed many times and this, this will be a tough one. Basically three things that we have to look at. People, planet, prosperity. Not just one thing. If we were to just look for prosperity, we would turn every human into a machine by connecting them. We would sell all the information, we would have no protection, and we would basically be completely naked because that's progress. It makes money, it makes trillions. We have to think of a new economic logic and that's starting to shape up. So I'm going to come to the end and we'll take some questions. So bottom line is the more that we connect, the more we must protect what makes us human. We used to think that the more we connect, the more we become human. That's obviously not true. You will not find happiness in the cloud or on the screen. What you find in the cloud or on the screen is hedonism. It's momentary happiness. And it's not a bad thing. You know, when I call my son in New Zealand on WhatsApp, I'm happy. I can use WhatsApp, it's free. But happiness is something else. It's a larger story of life. Protecting what makes us human means, for example, we have to have regulation and understanding of what is okay to do and what is not. Automatic weapons that kill people without human supervision? Definitely not. Provisions of leaving a mobile phone when you go to school? Maybe that's a good idea, like the debating in France. That will, of course, cause a lot of debate about which direction we're going. But what makes us human are all the invaluable things. Mystery, understanding, foresight, storytelling, intuition. Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. If you have kids, this is what they have to focus on in the future. It's great to have knowledge. You know, Einstein had a lot of knowledge. <laughs> but imagination, machines will never have. Well, I shouldn't say never, you know, it could be a hundred years, yeah, different discussion. <laughs> but machines don't have emotions, they don't exist. You may know the German word Dasein, existence. Machines don't exist. 
And how, how can the machine that looks at my face and says, Gerd is angry, the machine does know, not know what a face is or what a face feels like, and it certainly doesn't know what angry is. It can identify it, but it cannot be angry. It's a very, very big difference. So the biggest danger today is not the machines will kill us. Forget about all the stuff you see from Hollywood and Black Mirror and, and X Machina. You know, those, that's entertaining. <laughs> okay? The biggest challenge is that we become too much like the machine. We get too lazy, we stop having personal contacts, we fall in love with our machines, we don't leave the house, we order stuff, right? we don't pay the right places, we don't support public media. That is the biggest challenge. The more you become like a machine, you will be basically useless in 10 years. And because machines are learning the things that we can do. Anything that's routine, machines will learn. It's the end of routine. But here's the good news. The end of the routine is not the end of work. It is just the end of routine. If you're a doctor and you're looking up a disease in your books or online after you've spoken to a patient, in the future, you don't have to do that. You can do it right at the hospital bed with a small robot that has access to 500 million facts and pictures. That's a routine that can go. It's not a big problem. It just means you change your job. If your job is 100% routine, you are in deep trouble. And that is our reality. We should not sugarcoat this. We have to be ready for this change when people like truck drivers and fast food workers and bookkeepers and call center people are going to lose their job of 98%. Then we have to think about what that will do for us, but here's the positive part. Anything that cannot be digitized turned into an algorithm becomes hugely valuable. And this is what our kids have to learn. Our kids have to learn how to understand nature, silence, boredom, creativity, imagination, invention, improvising, that's really what they have to learn, because their future is going to be not having a fixed job, but hopping from job to job or on-demand work like many people already do today. 50%. I mean, look at the facts that are positive. Only 5% of all routine jobs can be fully automated. So yes, a pilot can be automated. The plane can fly itself. But would you go in an airplane without a pilot? The reason the pilot is there is because of us, not because of the machine. So that we still have a pilot. We're still going to have a doctor. We're still going to have lawyers. We may not have many bookkeepers. I don't know, depending on how good your bookkeeping is. Right? But here's other good news. 85% of all new jobs have not been invented yet. We should not be so negative about this. We should be more inventive. I mean, this is a huge fact. Do you know that uh, around the world there's 31 million social media managers? You know, you know what that is, managing your social media output or input, right? That job didn't exist 10 years ago. There was no social media 30, 10 years ago. And now we have 31 million. So if you can invent your job, you'll have a good future. To invent your job, you have to do this. Emotions, creativity, imagination. In the future, the less we work like a robot, the better. And this is something that we have in Europe. We generally don't work a lot like robots. We're, you know, we're more humanistic, we have more humanistic values, and that, I think, is a saving grace that we're going to see. So to summarize, you know, in terms of education, we need to get away from this idea that as long as we have technology and people are scientists, mathematicians, engineers, we're fine. That's obviously not the truth. Because machines will learn that as well. Now we have the other skills, what I call hecky, as opposed to STEM, humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. We need to marry the two in schools, in universities, and in funding. They should be equally funded. More music, more philosophy, more art, more sports, more exploration, more entrepreneurship in school, not just coding and math and engineering. 
because we're not going to beat machines in these disciplines in the near future. So bottom line is we looking at our cards, we still have the same cards, technology ads cards all the time. We need to make sure we invest the same amount of money and time in humanity as we invest in technology. I mean, that's why we're here. We're having a discussion here at a Cultura event. I mean, we're discussing things here. This is part of what we have to do to invest in humanity. So the bottom line is really this, you know, this technology uh, innovations are coming in a, in a wild, furious pace, and basically all of those are going to be substantially impacting everything we do, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, quantum computing. We're going to be in a world where that is the new normal. And that you have to understand. Whether you want like technology or not, this is really something that's happening. And on top of that, we have to place what we like. The future is awesome humans on top of amazing technology. Can we have a future where we just have amazing technology? That's not enough. Can we have a future where we're just awesome humans? That would be nice, but it's not very realistic. <laughs> so somehow we have to find a way to that future. And I think we can. We're not too late. We have the will. Now we just have to execute. Because the bottom line for me is we need to embrace technology, but not become it. Thanks very much for listening.